I want to invite you at this time to go ahead and open up the hymnal in front of you to turn to the hymn of the day, hymn 512. We're going to use that and we're going to sing that periodically in the midst of the sermon, so you want to have that and be ready for that. In fact, let's, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start off by singing that through one time. So the other day I met my match, and my match was a child's pack and play. If you don't know what this is, it's a playpen slash bassinet slash convertible. I don't know what it is. It does all these things. And we realized, my wife and I, we have five weeks to go now until our first son is born. And so I was like, well, it's all on the floor. It's in pieces. I need to get this out. Let's clean this up. I'll put this together real quickly before bedtime, right? Of course, we got it from, uh, from somebody else. We got it secondhand, and it has no instructions. It's spread out literally in like a million pieces on my floor, and I'm watching three different YouTube videos about how to assemble your pack and play. And the ladies on the video are making me feel very inadequate because mine is not going together near as easily as theirs is. And I just realized, you know, and I let out this huge sigh. I'm like, <sighs> you know, frustrating. And from the kitchen table, my wife just says, well, welcome to fatherhood. <laughs> I said, thank you. All right. You know, I, I've gotten to this point now where no matter how much I do, how much I read or I get ready, I realize I'm never going to be 100% ready for what's going to happen. And that's hard for me as a planner to realize and understand. But yet I'm there. And I know and we, we see and hear to the doctors our son is growing and still growing inside my wife. And this is, this is happening. And yet somehow I just kind of, even though I don't know how I'm going to be when he gets here, I step back and it still happens. <laughs> You know, it still happens. It's this beautiful mystery of life of how it just happens. And maybe that's a little bit what Christ is talking about or a little bit what this gospel is about, this mysterious growing of the seed that the gospel talks about. This kingdom that grows secretly and it says the farmer does not know how, right? We can relate to that. Sometimes we don't know how. We're baffled and confused. And here's the thing about parables, because if you read a parable and you think, oh, that's so nice, I love that, that makes sense, the thing is you probably missed the point. <laughs> because parables, they're not little short, pithy sayings, you know, that, that always make you feel comfortable. They're something that they mess you up, right? They remind you there's a lot that you don't know that we can't understand. They make you wonder about something that is bigger than yourself. There's a layer to that. 
that reminds us that we don't know how, but yet the kingdom of God continues to grow, it says in the parable. We don't know how. And so the next question that I think of is, well, how do we know that what we do makes a difference? How do we know that? Well, it's clear in the parable that the parable isn't about the patience of the farmer. <laughs> it isn't about all the right things the farmer does in order to get it to get it to grow. It's about a kingdom that just grows. It grows beside, away from ourselves. The kingdom of God is not about us. It's about something that grows. And it's hard to control. It's hard to understand. It's hard to make sense of. And it takes root. And it just spreads. And that's, there's something beautifully mysterious about that. Perhaps Jesus is announcing this arrival of the kingdom of God, even when we don't know how, that kingdom grows. struck by this reading in Ezekiel, this image of God, which is different, the image of God as a planter or as a tender, as one who plants this sprig and it grows into this large, noble cedar tree, right? It planted on the mountain height of Israel on Zion, and then it creates this space where every kind of bird comes and lives and rests and nests. It's a beautifully, beautiful and majestic picture of this noble cedar. And then a few hundred years later, Jesus comes along and says, okay, not to burst your bubble about that great noble cedar, but the kingdom, it's actually more like a mustard shrub, right? <laughs> he says, it's not what you expect it to be. It's like a mustard seed that just inevitably grows. And in Jesus' neck of the woods in his part of the world it is something that just inevitably grows it's something we don't plan for or you expect to see but yet that it's like the crabgrass in my yard that just keeps coming back right it's just something like that that you don't that you can't make sense of sometimes it reminds me that it, we did day camp this past week and so we had all these little ones up here and phil and i were doing the openings and closings and so i was doing a closing one day and at the closing the groups come up and they tell the whole camp what they talked about that week they say what they learned or what they did and one group is standing up there and telling me what they did and their spokesman is saying well we had a party and i said well you did you had a party what, what was that about and he goes it was a toilet paper themed party and I said, really, how does that work? And he goes, said very plainly, because God wipes away all the dirty stuff. <laughs> yeah, let it sink in for a minute. I, yeah. I can say fatherhood is going to be a lot of fun for me. I'm going to enjoy this. You can't make this stuff up, you know. But Jesus says, you think you got it all figured out. Well, let me show you something else. And you get hit with something like that, right? And it's no different with how God works through ways we don't expect. How God works through the weakness, the pain that we experience. How God works through even the ugliness of death on the cross to reveal something that we don't expect 
to reveal life, to reveal something that is beyond ourselves. I was talking with a group earlier this week, and we were kind of wondering, you know, what would it look like, what would it be like to take this hospitality of the mustard shrub seriously, not just in the church, but in our own lives? Now, what would it look like to have large branches where birds could nest or dwell or rest in the shade? And I think perhaps there's something to that. There's something to even the way here that we, in different ministries, reach out to make a difference in our communities. They remind us that it's about making space for another. It's about bringing comfort to the hurting. It's about dwelling together, being together with one who is alone. It's about bringing safety to one who lives often on the edge or providing for one who often has nothing. And we do it all for one that, guess what, we don't expect to be there in this mustard shrub of a kingdom. But yet, those moments happen and it grows. The presence of God is there, even if it's just for one moment, the presence of God is there, resting in those branches of God's love that we share with the world, working often invisibly that we do not know how, and yet that hope, hope is there as we walk together, as we delve into this mystery as a people of God together. Love grows, and hope, peace, is known. Corinthians talks about the love of Christ is what urges us on, for we are convinced that things have changed, (laughs) that everything looks different, that everybody looks different, and in this space where God is active, everything has become new. Everything is this new creation. This week at uh, Disciple Camp, which is the older kids of day camp, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, They lived this out. They went out. They didn't stay here at the church, but they went out to do acts of service. And they went out to a woman's house. She was 91 years young, and they painted her shed in her backyard and made it look new again, right? They brightened up her garden. They did some work out there, brightened her garden, and really what they were doing was brightening her spirits, brightening her day. They worked, they made um, sandwiches here to deliver down to the Presbyterian night shelter. And when they went down there, they started handing out bottles of water to all the folks who were there, right? They spent time in the kitchen making cookies that smelled so good. And they made these cookies to deliver and hand out to people who, in their own words, need cookies, right? And I think, who doesn't need cookies from time to time? They went out and they handed them out. They chose to hand them out to firefighters to people who work at the animal shelter down the street. You know, isn't it that absurdly simple sometimes? Share cookies, right? Share God's love. And in doing that, just a little bit, things suddenly start to look a little bit different, a little new. I think that's a little bit what 
Luther talks about, when he talks about the Lord's Prayer and he talks about that petition that we say, Thy kingdom come. And what he says is the kingdom of God, it comes of itself. It comes without our prayers. But yet when we say thy kingdom come, we pray and ask that it may also come to us. That it may come through us. That's that call to live in that kingdom. That new reality, that new era where God's intentions are fully realized and fully lived out. That's when the promise of the future sprouts in the present. When sharing a cookie means being God's heart with our human hands. When bread and wine from the table becomes God's love that feeds and nourishes us. That's the hope that we hold in our hands. It's the hope that grows in good soil. Let's stand and sing. our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father.